Uh, so Anton Alexeyev will tell us about Goldman brackets, Turayev co brackets, and formality. So thanks a lot. Uh, well, uh, I think Dror started this tradition by starting this. Apologies, I guess as a co-organizer, I also should, should, should speak, but still I do. Now, uh, so this talk is designed as an introduction to the talks of Florian uh, later this morning and Yusuke next week. Uh, well, I should also say that it's very much inspired by various talks and series of informal lectures that Maria Kawazumi and Yusuke Kunio gave on various formal and informal occasions. So I tried to, we'll see whether successful or not, to repeat those things. But so, of course, maybe I failed on some occasions. Um, so it's also supposed to be, uh, at least towards the end of the talk, it should be an example of one always set up, introduced by drawer yesterday, so the setup where we have a filled object and the graded object and we try to establish a relation between them. But um, we start with a very rather elementary uh, context in two-dimensional topology. We also, in, in the talk, maybe we'll move a little bit through the, through the fields and we'll be uh, starting in topology, then <coughs> revisiting geometry a little bit and drifting towards algebra towards the end of the talk. So, um, um, so I'll start with uh, the setup. Let's say that sigma would be a compact oriented manifold. Um, we will assume that the boundary of sigma is non empty, even though I will break. So I will, I will say things, but then I will break my own conventions from time to time. So we can imagine something of a sort. So G will be the genus, and there is this following kind of fine imitation, n plus 1 will be a number of boundary components, so there is at least one boundary component. Um, so it's also convenient to choose k the field of characteristic 0 and in in drawer stock, it was usually a Q, so you can think that it's Q if you want. Now, um, so one small introductory remark. So let's know by H the first homology of sigma. Uh, so we know that. Uh, this vector space carries the intersection the intersection theorem and um, it is so this intersection theorem since we have some now if, if n is bigger than zero there is some number of boundary components then um, this intersection theorem has a kernel, and um, in this kernel, uh, we can say that we have the following element. Let's denote the homology classes of boundary components by z0, z1, zn, right? There are n plus 1 of them. And in principle, one can, one can choose. Ah, oh, here it's tricky, right? One. Uh -huh. So one can choose, let's choose the orientations such that the relation between the etymology classes, it looks like, looks like this. So you notice Z1 
plus one plus the n. So here, right now, one shouldn't, one shouldn't try things. So um, maybe for the future. So I have two big questions. Why Daniel is in eight? Sorry. So the the shelf is eight eight to k, right? So the uh, so 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 the kernel is uh, right in H where you you don't have so things which have zero intersection is the rest. So, the kernel, by, by, by definition, the kernel, right, the intersection form takes two cycles and assigns the two cycles the intersection number. So, the kernel is the kernel of this. Uh, of this. The kernel is in domain. Sorry? The kernel is in domain. It's in domain. So um, for the future, maybe we prepare the following notion. So we can introduce a two-step filtration on H. So we say that uh, H is equal to H1 and it contains H2, which is, which is the kernel of the intersection form. So in the future, it will be convenient to, um, to use this. All right, so uh, our main actor will be not homology, but rather the fundamental tool. So uh, let's <coughs> see the base point on the uh, uh, on one of the components of the boundary. Let's 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 choose the component of the boundary with number zero, and let's denote by pi the corresponding fundamental group. Um, so one of the, um, or maybe the main, the main actor in this talk is the following vector space. So we take a case span of three out of the classes of oriented loops in sigma. So we can imagine something like this. So there is a full loop, we can move it. And perhaps uh, it's convenient to, uh, to introduce several equivalent definitions for, for this space. One can also say that this is a span of uh, k span of uh, conjugacy classes in pi, right? Because we can always attach, let's say, if this is our base point, right? So we can always attach a loop to that base point to obtain an element of pi 1, but since we can attach it in many ways, so this will give rise to different elements in the same conjugacy class. Or maybe even more algebraically, we can say that this is a group ring of k pi divided by the vector space spent by commutators in the tree. And um, actually, right, so these are this is a topologically appealing formulation, but maybe algebraically that's that's a nicer formulation. And um, here it's convenient that so this vector space, it receives a canonical projection from k 
Ki, and following Kawazumi and Kuno notation, I will denote it by absolute value. So sometimes uh, we also before denote it by, by trace, because it's, divide, it's division of some ring by the space of commutators, so you can say that this is a universal trace. On, on this space, but well, that's a more economic notation, a beautiful notation, with the absolute value. So here maybe just to give an example, suppose we have alphabetic gamma elements of pi, then a typical element of this space will be, so you take a product of alphabetic and gamma, and you take a projection to this space of commutators, then this behaves as if it were on the trace, so there is a cyclic property. So this is equal to instance to gamma alpha beta, and you can further cyclically rotate onto this absolute value sign. So um, the uh, one, one of the uh, um, the constructions that you probably know, but I'll still remind you uh, that we're going to discuss today is the construction of the Volkmann bracket. So the Volkmann bracket is an operation which takes two elements of G of sigma and maps it to G of sigma. And it's given by the following explicit formula. Let me write it down and then draw it. So if we choose, let's say, two elements of pi and we take their absolute value so that now it leaves in the space G of sigma, and the Volkmann bracket is given by the sum of the sections of alpha and beta, here there is some sign that we described in a second, and here there is some class of some new element, alpha p, beta p. So, um, so what, 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 what does it mean? Let me briefly recall. So suppose that on the drawing here, this orange loop is alpha, so then we will be the yellow loop beta, and we choose representatives of, uh, of those free homotopy classes such that there is only a finite number of intersections and all the intersections are transverse intersections. So in particular, here we have one visible intersection and that's this point P that we have there. So in particular, usually that's a finite sum. Now what is alpha P by the P? Uh, well, we can now start at this point P and first go around alpha and then around beta. This gives a new free loop, and that's the free loop that we have over there on the right hand side. In fact, uh, you can also go first around beta and then around alpha. It doesn't matter because there is this uh, cyclic, cyclic property, right? You can start with alpha or start with beta, it will give the same thing. Now, what is epsilon P? Um, let me redraw here this intersection point. Okay. So there is so that was alpha and beta was intersecting it. So here was was sitting the point P. And uh, so we have a tangent vector to alpha and a tangent vector to the curve beta and they form a basis in the tangent space which has some orientation, either positive or negative, with respect to the orientation of sigma. So this relative orientation gives a plus or minus sign. So the relative orientation. Maybe just one more remark. When we, do, when we make this new loop, alpha p by the p, we can also say that we resolve this singularity, right? There is a unique way to resolve it without changing their orientations, right? So, 
So that's that's the only resolution which smoothens this singularity here, and actually that's what happens. So this smoothening of the singularity makes out of two loops one loop. So now let me formulate a theorem. Um, so how is it? Yesterday there was a discussion of what's the right way to erase this uh, this black one. I already forgot what way. Kind of effect. I'm clearly doing it in the wrong way. <laughs> Whatever, it's, like the result clearly shows that it's good enough, Anton. Sorry. It's good enough. It's good enough. Yeah, well, I think anyways to, to do it better, it's it's kind of uh, hopeless for me, but. Uh, yeah, this saw the very good results yesterday. All right, so um, theorem. Mr. Goldman says the following. So the Goldman bracket is first of all well defined. And well, right, it's described now in terms of representatives, and one can change representatives, but it turns out that it's independent of the choice. And then it's a Lie bracket. I think it's, uh, it's obvious that it is Q-symmetric, right? Because uh, if you exchange the roles of alpha and beta, this part of the expression doesn't change, but the orientation of the basis changes, changes sign, so, but, but still the Jepagi identity would be a good exercise. Maybe, let me just say one, one word. Uh, so an example of what we need to do in proving things. So when we say that it's well defined, so when we change representatives a priori, there are some radio master moves that may happen, right, when we change the picture. For instance, what happens if you look at Rademeister 2? So this was, say, <coughs> alpha and this was beta. And suppose that we want to do, we want to implement the Rademeister 2 move, which would go to, to disjoint. To disjoint curves. Well, here we had two intersection points. And it's easy to check that uh, uh, whatever they are, their signs, they will be opposite, right? Because the, the basis changes the, the, the relative orientation of those two vectors. It exchanges the roles. So let's assume that here it was plus one, that here it will be minus one. And then it's easy to see that the resulting, resulting curve will not change the common copy class and uh, as a result, we will have two terms which are on the right hand side, and that sum will have two terms which have the same expression, the same homotopy class, but opposite signs, and they will cancel out, and that's what we want to prove that the radio master move 2 actually works. Now, a somewhat more complicated picture you need to use for radio master 3, and also somewhat similar to radio master 3 would be the consideration to show that actually the Jacobi identity is satisfied. Um, right. So maybe here I would like to add a little bit of remarks about the nature of the golden bracket and then there will be a geometric a geometric digression. So I guess again, similar to the drawer, from time to time, I should be asking you that it's too boring and too slow. Um, yeah, of course you're in principle supposed to say no, it's okay, but but in case it's really slow, then well, don't hesitate. To express your feelings. So, some remarks. Uh, first of all, um, if it has a trivial loop in G, 
energy of sigma it's a central element and it's, it's clear why, right? that's because suppose you have some loop alpha and then a trivial loop beta intersects it then, well, of course you can always move it away, right? so you can always change the representative such that the two loops Oh, sorry, that was all. So the two loops no longer touch, and if there are no intersections, there are no terms on the right hand side, and the bracket is zero. Um, okay, so another remark actually. Uh, one can give a formula for the center of G of sigma and here maybe uh, Lauren and Gisuke can help me with a reference what's the correct attribution of this result let me first write this result in a somewhat wrong way uh, well, I'll write a formula which is somewhat wrong but and then we'll correct it so, so some over j from 0 to n, and here and here will be this expression, we have gamma j's so these are, these are, these are the boundary so if this is my, my surface, so these are gammas, they are, they, they are the loops which go around the boundary, this sum orientation. So there will be, again, n plus one of them. So we can take powers of them. And so, so power would mean that I go around that loop many times. So the power may be zero, then it's a trivial loop by definition. The power can be negative, then I go in the opposite direction. So, uh, and the claim is that all these elements turn out to be central and that's the, the, there is nothing else so they're central, that's clear why, right? if you have some loop which is in the middle you can always push this boundary loop towards the boundary along this, uh, this neck along this tubular neighborhood of the boundary circle and then make it disjoint from anything that happens inside now the formula is slightly wrong because if s is equal to zero, we get a trivial loop all the time. So this direct sum is actually not, not quite a direct sum. Maybe one should better say s in z non-zero plus k1 plus that element of the center that we already encountered. So what was the right attribution? Uh, it's a theorem by Kamiraji. K A B I. Um, so one more remark. In fact, so we we're not going to uh, dive into it, but um, the Goldman bracket and then electron drive co bracket. So uh, these are things that which are which, which were and which are very much started in topology, and in particular, uh, maybe not, maybe I, 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 I maybe I, I go with this remark later, but let, let me give an example instead. Yes. So an example, an example will break my rules a little bit. I will choose sigma to be a two-dimensional torus. So there is no boundary for a moment. So in this case, uh, G of sigma has a very nice and very explicit description. So this is a span of generators. Let me call them alpha and n. And m and n are integers. 
So these are just loops which go n times around, say, the A cycle of my torus and n times around the B cycle. Um, and here I can write an explicit formula for the golden bracket. So alpha and n, alpha m prime m prime, Goldman is equal to m m prime minus m prime n alpha m plus m prime m plus m prime. And notice that here, so this thing, that's the intersection pairing applied to the homology class of alpha and n. And to homology class of alpha and prime and prime. So you take those three loops, you take their homology classes, you apply the pairing, and that's exactly this partition that we get here. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but apart from this case, I'm not sure whether there is any uh, situation, even very simple, when the, uh, when the Goldman Lee algebra admits such an explicit description. Maybe one can invent still some really trivial cases. So but is this a famous Lee algebra in any sense? It's so this one? Yeah. Elsewhere, I mean, do do people uh, in algebra yeah, study it without? I mean, probably. I, I I'm not quite sure. Maybe, maybe that's an easy instance of some kind of toroidal, toroidal Lie algebra. So I, I think one one can find such a thing in other um, in other approaches in, in other parts of this theory. But to what extent it's famous, I'm not sure. Um, for us, I guess it would be interesting if, uh, um, if, for instance, the Golden Lie algebra already for a sphere with three boundary components. For instance, that one would be kind of, if we had a similar explicit description, that would simplify our life. Um, or maybe a torus, but with one boundary component. So these, these are two key, kind of key issues. But if we have a, uh, just an annulus, then you have two boundary components, right? Yeah, for the annulus problem. And then segment number two, you need to modify. Yeah, 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 right. So there, you, you're right. There, there would be, there, there would be some degenerate, there would be some exceptions, some degenerate cases where what I say is not quite true. If it's sufficiently non-degenerate, this will be true. Right. So now, um, a small geometric digression. So now I'm trying to algorithm. First, vertical and horizontal. by GLN. In fact, um, so this is not a very good portion, and one would, strictly speaking, need to say, what do I mean by that, to, to introduce some good topology. But let me, in the first approximation, just ignore this pro problem. So, um, so this space, is a Poisson space. Uh, 
uh, by the uh, tier-block construction. Usually, it's formulated as a symplectic space, but then you impose some conditions on the surface. Maybe it's more convenient to, to state that this is a Poisson space. So functions of this space carry a Poisson bracket. Now, uh, so let's consider the following map that I will denote by G. And this map maps let me introduce here sigma so maps this, uh, this golden vector space g of sigma into the functions of this modular space in fact for us it is also interesting to lift this map to polynomials uh, to, to, to the symmetric algebra of this space, so the formal properties. So we will lift it simply if we want to know how to map an element here, we know how to map a product of elements just to product of the corresponding functions. Right? So what, what is this map? Uh, so uh, the point of MN, that's uh, a, an equivalence class of representations of pi into g of n. So let's think just of a one representation in that class. So let me say the element here is a class of representations. So uh, g of some element alpha of g of sigma, it should be mapping this class of representations to numbers, right? And the corresponding number is a trace of rho of alpha. Right? So so that's that's a very simple formula, but I, I don't know, if you see it uh, for the nth time, that's the formula is trivial. If you see it for the first time, the formula is probably slightly confusing. So again, we have alpha, which is this uh, free loop. So now the corresponding alpha without absolute value is an element of pi. So rho in the brackets is a class of representations. Rho is a particular representation. So rho of alpha is an n by n matrix. Trace of this rho of alpha is a number, right? And uh, of course, here one needs to show that if we choose a different representative alpha or a different representative rho, then we still get the same thing, but that's by, this, by, by the invariant, invariant property of the trace, right? That's because every time we need to conjugate by something if we change representatives alpha and rho. So for this reason, this formula is, is well defined. And now, of course, if you know how to how to map one loop to functions, we take a uh, formal product of loops, we map it to the product of functions. Now, um, let's algebraically and then let me state it in, in words. So algebraically the statement will be as follows. So let's take the function corresponding to alpha under this Goldman map for some alpha and another function corresponding to some other loop beta. So then so these are two functions on the modular space and since the modular space is Poisson you can then see a broad Poisson bracket of those two functions. So there will be a new function of the modular space. And the theorem says that, so this is G of the Volkman bracket of alpha and beta. Right? So, 
So the Poisson bracket of a tier block and the Golden bracket on the loops, so they're related by this formula. And as far as I understand, I guess that's how the, the Golden bracket was discovered in the first place. So it was probably like written it backwards, which led to the definition, or maybe not. But in any event, now one can state it in that way. Um, maybe um, some more remarks. In fact, you can state it in some of more scientific terms, because so G of sigma is a Lie algebra. And then its symmetric algebra is automatically a Poisson algebra. It's Poisson. So that's because Joe Sigma is Lee. And, and then this theorem you can restate it by saying that this map G, the Goldman map. Is a Poisson map. Um, oh, oh, that I may I made a big mistake. Oh, no. Because this one doesn't move. Okay. Um, so one, 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 one last remark about this geometric setup. Um, in fact, the map G is. Subjective or dense. Uh, it depends a little bit on what is set up. You see, because I very vaguely said we consider functions. But what kind of functions actually on what? Because this question, I, I didn't make it precise what it is. So if I consider some kind of polynomial, polynomial functions, then, then the map G will be subjective. One can obtain all polynomials, all, all reasonably defined polynomials. If you want to consider whatever, maybe some topology of the space and maybe some smooth functions in that topology, then as usual, polynomial functions will be sufficiently dense there. And you will, so, so, so in any event, for all practical purposes, you, you get all the functions in the image. Of, uh, of the Goldman map. But, uh, but, but, but of course, the, the map is not injective. So for every n, you would have a huge kernel inside G of sigma. So G of sigma is, you can say, or, or S of G of sigma, this is some kind of uh, universal functions on modular spaces of flat connections. OK. So, right. Now I would like to introduce one more structure uh, on G of sigma. So G of sigma has this very nice Lie bracket, a beautiful Lie bracket, which is defined completely in topological terms. But it turns out that it has a lot more structure. And uh, so the next thing is the right call bracket. Well, so let me do a picture of my surface. So this time this will be sphere without these three boundary components. And let's say let's say this is our curve alpha. So then, uh, to run, define an operation which now uses just one curve and produces from it, um, well, let me try to write it down and then discuss. So there will be some fine notation that P will be now in intersection of alpha with itself. So meaning that these are transverse self-intersections of alpha. So here will be epsilon p, alpha p prime, which alpha p double prime, where the notation is essentially the same. So, so here there is this point p. So at the point p, we can again take a resolution of singularities 
which uh, preserves orientation. And similar to as before, we had uh, intersections of two curves, and the resolution would make them into one curve. Now the resolution makes it into two separate curves. So uh, we can call them, for instance, the first one of P prime, the second one of P double prime. Uh, so it will be again a well-defined sign. And what is nice, actually, you don't need to choose which one is the first, which one is the second, because the batch product will change the sign if you reverse prime and double prime, and also this that sign will change. So the right-hand side is a well-defined quantity. And here is the theorem. Right, which says that delta is well defined. Call leaf, whatever it is, you need to just reverse all the axioms. Um, maybe I should say one cos cycle with respect to the golden bracket, and here is the addition of chance, the composition of the bracket and co-bracket is zero. Here perhaps I should say that the co-bracket from geo sigma to wedge to geo sigma. Um, there is one small problem with this statement that I wrote there. Um, so that's every time that in, in talk, pedagogically it's better to do it this way, but in, in but when in this way I assign to derive something which is wrong. And, well, this is probably not very fair. So the theorem is actually false. And um, what is false, probably, I don't know, probably, I don't know, all of you know what is false? Or, so those of you who don't know, what's your guess? Which, which part is false? So there is one of the four statements which is false. And, well yeah, I mean, yeah, it is. It is the first one, which basically makes all the others not not very. Uh, so this is so this is actually false, and that's for the following reason. So remember, already in the discussion of the open bracket, the uh, Paying attention to those um, trivial loops. So there is a bit of a problem with them because uh, um, suppose you have some very interesting curve with many self intersections, and then somewhere you have this whatever element that you are using in Radio Master 1, right? So this part you can trade for this, right? So that's that's the same. However, in, in the formula that I wrote, so this would give a non-trivial contribution. You can split it off. This would give uh, one times this whole curve, and you cannot basically you, you cannot prevent it. This this makes the construction invalid. So um, there are two possible solutions. Um, so one solution is to consider another Lie algebra. Just divide by trivial curves. So then, then the formula is well defined, and one obtains a canonical structure of uh, what is called the Levi algebra. So there is a Lie bracket, a Lie co-bracket. There is some relation between them, and even some extra property due to chance. 
So that's, that's one possibility. Another possibility to choose a framing on sigma, that is a trivialization of the Cantian bundle. If there is at least one boundary component, then <coughs> uh, the Cantian bundle is always trivial. You can, you can trivialize it. And then once the Cantian bundle is trivialized, you can assign to curves rotation numbers. So, uh, and then for instance, you can require that all your curves, they have rotation number zero. So this would tell you how many of those things you should add or subtract. Because every time you add such a thing, right, so this, uh, this, small, this small curve, we change the rotation number by 1 or by 2 pi, depending on your rotation, the rotation number. And so, so now, actually, this, this will not be allowed, such a move, because it does change. So rate of to 1 will be forbidden. It's probably a paid version of the uh, story that Bohr mentioned yesterday for uh, framings in the three-dimensional case, these are framings in the two-dimensional case. Right, and so in this case, what will happen? We now have uh, delta, but it will depend on the frame. So here there will be canonical uh, derived co bracket. Here there will be the whole family of co brackets depending on the frame. So both things are possible. So we usually work with, uh, for technical reasons, we usually work with this story. Uh, so this story would be more canonical. Can you say why you wouldn't be allowed? Because you only allow frame in equals zero? Or Sorry? Why you say again why the stuff wouldn't be allowed? No, because it, cha it changes the frame. Or it changes the rotation number. Right? So when, when you do such a move, you change the rotation number of your curve. And you say that you only consider curves, say, of rotation number zero. But it would just create also a trigger component which would balance. Sorry? Right. It would create a trigger loop which would balance the training, no? No, but first we, we say, uh, if, I, if, I, if I do this change, right? Does it are, the, are these two representatives of the same free homotopy class? And I say no, because one of them is simply forbidden. It, it does not exist in my goal. So the one where rotation number is not zero, I just don't consider them. So then in each former free homotopy class, I, I only consider representatives with rotation number zero, where I add as many radio master ones, so I subtract as many radio master ones as needed. Of course, if I change the frame, Rotation numbers change, so I will have to change my representatives. And then eventually delta f, right, it will change by exactly the same phenomenon as we had before. So, but, but okay, uh, uh, from now on for the uh, whatever short remaining time of talk, uh, we, we, we act as if this problem did not exist. So later on, probably, maybe in some other talks, you will see it again, but that's just to tell you that that's the truth. So either you work with the canonical one, or you work with the one which is frame independent. Um, so now I, I would like to do two more things. So one thing is uh, another geometric digression. So I, I want to discuss now what happens in terms of moduli spaces, uh, if we take into account this delta. And so this will be a brief digression. And then another thing that I want to discuss is filtrations and then the statement of the, uh, of the formality problem. So, so the digression. Uh, we want to know what's the role of this delta in geometry. So in the theory of moduli <coughs> flat connections. And I should say that uh, this um, um, golden story, that's a classical story which is used in many things. Um, Tribes delta was known already for quite some time. But, um, 
there is no canonical answer to the question of its role in geometry. Now, um, I would like to suggest one possible idea. is uh, Florian Yankun and Paul Sidera. So in fact the idea is as follows uh, that it's difficult to find a role for delta if you stay in the world of groups. Instead it's better to go to supergroups and concretely, let me introduce the following gadget, QN, which are n by n matrices, uh, times the Clifford algebra of this one generator. Let me denote it by theta. So theta is odd, and theta squared is 1. So, um, inside we can consider uh, QN cross, so that's the set of invertible elements. And now we can consider MN of sigma, so this will be a now a super space. Of representations now in QM cross. So um, now a theorem, that's a kind of analog of the Goldman's theorem. Maybe we can discuss it a little bit, but I maybe don't want to discuss it too much. I'll just explain what it says. So before the idea, the idea what theorem was saying that the Morphy space was a Poisson space. Now F M of sigma is a so-called B space. And this means the following. <coughs> So there is an operator delta acting on functions of m and sigma, and this operator is a second order differential operator. and delta square is equal to zero. So to some extent, the construction of this delta is similar, is a kind of upgrade of the construction of the uh, uh, Poisson bracket due to a T and one. So one should probably say that, um, so you know, since you want to interpret what happens with drive core bracket, in fact, there is not one operator for this whole family, we depend on the frame, but as I said, we pretend that this framing problem does not exist, so we don't pay too much attention to it. Um, now, remember that in the Goldman story, we were mapping into the functions on the modular space, the Goldman space, and actually a symmetric algebra of the Goldman space. So now we'll be mapping instead the exterior algebra of the Goldman, Goldman space. And it is also a BV algebra. So this, this gadget also carries uh, a BV operator. And this BV operator is defined by the following properties, like we call it delta g. Well, delta g of 1 is 0. 
delta G of one loop is simply given by the prior delta with the appropriate framing. And right, that's a second order dif differential operator by definition. So you need to define it on elements of degree 0, 1, and 2. And after that, it's automatically defined. So what it is on elements of degree 2? So delta of uh, alpha batch beta. So this is equal to delta G of alpha batch beta. Uh, minus beta batch delta G of alpha and plus the golden bracket of alpha and beta. So you see this delta is kind of one operator which, uh, which has all this structure that we had before. It knows about Delta, it knows about the golden bracket, and the fact that it squares to zero, it actually it actually takes into account it's responsible for all these properties. For the fact that the golden bracket is Li, delta is poly, and that they are related by this cos alpha property, and even this equation is needed for delta square being zero. So, so it, it, it has all these equations together. So now, what's the envelope of the... Um, so you mean not every binary algebra will lead to a BD algebra under this construction? You need those properties also? Yeah, when, when, I think for delta square one needs this property. Yeah. So, yeah, so I said, yeah. how, how it's called this, uh, this property? Involved. They, they call it involuntive. Yeah. I think they, otherwise delta square will not be zero. Uh, so is there a typo just on the right corner? So that the second term. This one? Yeah, that it's alpha in the first. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's normal, right? So towards the end, the talk should start degenerating a little. <laughs> Hmm. So what's the motivation for the letters BB? Sorry? What's oh, BB. Uh, in fact, this whole story was invented in physics for quantization of gauge theories. And it is, it is uh, called after the authors Batalin and Wilkowski, who introduced this method. Whatever. This, maybe this is a mathematical restatement, but they, they had this machinery to, to make sense of uh, quantization of gauge theories to start with. Um, right, so now um, recall that um, the, uh, uh, so, so we had uh, this Boltman theorem which was saying that semantic algebra maps into functions and that was a Poisson map. Now uh, let me formulate an analog of this theorem so there will be some uh, Beautiful gene, which maps this exterior algebra to functions of beautiful M. And this will be a DV map, right? Before it was a Poisson map, now it will be a DV map. Now I should just say what it is, right? So, and G of alpha will be sent row to the trace of theta times row of alpha. So, when one multiplies here, you remember we have. We have this generator of the Clifford algebra, so we, we multiply by some odd element here. So therefore, before the functions were even, now these are these are odd functions. That, that's why we actually have a map from the exterior algebra to the uh, instead of the symmetric algebra. So, but um, 
but then it turns out that that's a correct setup which uh, encodes both the bracket and the core bracket. Um, let's say at the moment it's not quite known, like it's, it's nice, but at the moment it's not quite known what will be the uses of this construction. So before, like people were using a lot, or are using a lot the golden bracket, and related to the theory of modular spaces and so on. So that's that's a big and nice topic. So this topic, yeah, at the moment it's a nice but small topic. We don't know yet whether one can build some building from this basement. But still So at some point you had a generalization or a rewrite of this Goldman Turayev uh, in terms of uh, double brackets. Yeah, that's right. And does this live together nicely with uh, this stuff with delta and theta? And uh, yeah, probably. Then, then one would need to replace BV by uh, quasi some something which, which is called quasi BV. So this is this would be something like double brackets. That's essentially on on the ge geometric side. If you go to geometry, double brackets. That's the uh, that's quasi Poisson. Essential in essence. So um, now, if you if you want to to see the envelope of uh, double brackets and of the uh, Kawazumi Kuno operation or Kawazumi Kuno action, so then you probably need to do this quasi BV. And quasi BV uh, this means essentially that on the right hand side we have some controllable some controllable defect. But yeah, I think it's, it's, it's all doable. It's, it's not, well, this is still all in progress a little bit. But, yeah, I think that's, that will probably work. So, um, so now I would like to finish with the last topic and this uh, So I at length described for you this structure. So it comes from topology, and as you see it, it is related to geometry of modular spaces. But now we would like to set it up a little bit in the style that uh, Drawer developed yesterday. And so, so we'll, we'll see that this is the kind of filtered part of some story which made me the graded part. So, uh, note that actually, um, so yesterday the idea was that the uh, filtered part of the story is kind of quantum, and the graded part of the story may be some kind of classical. But here, actually, as you see, everything is kind of classical in some sense. We're speaking about Poisson brackets, or we're speaking about differential operators on some super super spaces, super manifolds. So like here there is nothing is quantized yet. It's it's all classical. Nevertheless there is an interesting formality question. So about filtrations. Uh, so uh, let's introduce some standard basis in part. So let's say will be alpha 1, alpha g, beta 1, beta g, uh, and we already introduced generators gamma 1, gamma n. Uh, we have one more boundary component, gamma naught, but it's not independent, right? It can be expressed in terms of the generators, and we can choose, for instance, orientations such that gamma naught is a product of group commutators of alphas times the product of, of gammas from 1 to n. So that's the extra boundary component. So now um, we would like to introduce a filtration on pi and um, contrary to Okay, kind of maybe here it's slightly counterintuitive how one does it, but the idea is as follows. So we will be introducing the 
decrease in filtration such that the degrees of alpha minus 1 or beta minus 1 is equal to 1. So that's what one does in introducing the augmentation ideal. Right? But uh, the degree of gamma j minus 1, instead, it will be equal to 2, instead of 1. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe Suki will be speaking in more detail about it, or maybe not. I, I'm not sure, but let me say just, 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 just one word. Uh, so there are various justifications why that's the right way to do it. One comes from the Hodge theory, and that, that I don't know much about. So Hodge theory says do this. Um, maybe more mm, topologically, so suppose you have a boundary component of your surface. And uh, what you can do, you can include it in a bigger surface by gluing a handle to it. So this handle would introduce one more alpha and one more beta for your surface. Okay? And uh, so then this boundary component, this gamma, it will be a commutator of alpha and beta corresponding to the new to, to the new handle. But then it's easy to check that if the degree of alpha minus one and degree of beta minus one is one, then the degree of the group commutator is two. So so this would be so this filtration would be compatible with uh, with those balloons. So this is perhaps one motivation to do it. So, um, so the degree of gamma zero is mean, right? It's not uh, the degree of gamma zero uh, will also be two. Yeah, the degree of gamma zero minus one. The degree of gamma zero minus one will also be two. So we'll see in a second. Yeah, they, they, maybe we'll see it a bit more clearly in a second. Um, so uh, this filtration will induce filtration on the um, on the group ring, and this will induce a filtration on GL sigma. And the question is, what's the what's the associated gradient, or maybe uh, yeah. So what's the associated gradient? So it turns out that one can express the answer in terms of uh, the uh, homology. And well, let me write for you the answer, and then. So you build a new non-community algebra, and remember, right in the beginning, I bothered you with this stuff that homology a priori that's that's actually filtered, right? The uh, first homology is filtered with this uh, kernel of the uh, uh, of the intersection pairing. So here, that's this guy is a graded is is the associated graded of the homology, right? Homology has a two-step filtration. So we can maybe write it in the following way. So uh, let me denote the homology classes of alphas by x's and homology classes of betas by y's, or maybe by a's and b's, not true. So let's consider a vector space spanned by those a's and b's. So these are homology classes of those guys. So this is the degree one part, and then there will be a, a degree two part of the homology. Right? So this uh, so this guy is now uh, a graded vector space with two degrees one and two, and you now take the Tensor algebra of that guy and divide by commutators in that Tensor algebra. 
So um, one can maybe also say these are cyclic words in the alphabet A I D I Z J. So elements there will be something like this. I will again denote the canonical projection by absolute value, something like A1, B2, C3. And this is equal to C3, A1, B2, and so on. So that's the, that's, that's the associated gradient. So that's again a vector space. And um, there is a theorem due to Kawazumi and Kuno, and it says that uh, the Goldman bracket and drive four bracket for any frame. Uh, continuous topology induced by this filtration. So this implies many things. So in particular, you can extend the uh, bracket and co-bracket to the uh, completion under this filtration. So it also induces the uh, uh, the bracket and co-bracket on the associated grade. So. Um, on the associated grade, so here, they will be graded bracket and degraded co bracket, and they turn out to be of degree equal to minus 2. So I'll now show you some sample formulas for these things. So, so you see what, what, what we now obtained, right? We had some topologically defined object, which was kind of nice if you tried to make drawings for the bracket or core bracket. <coughs> but if you really want to work with them, they are relatively difficult gadgets. Now uh, we have a graded object, and these things are relatively simple. So let me let me show you some. So for that, let me draw those cyclic words in some way. So it will be convenient for me to draw a cyclic word as a circle. And here, letters I write on the circle. And I read letters along this direction. For instance, suppose that here I have a letter x1 or a1. I have some other letters. And I want to take the golden bracket or gray bracket is some other word. Where here you have, uh, you have a letter B1 and then some other letters. So this gray bracket is doing the following thing it is looking for pairs of letters with non-trivial intersection pairing, right? These are, recall, these are homology classes. There is this intersection pairing that we started with, and A1 has an intersection pairing 1 with B1. Okay. So it takes this intersection pairing of A1, B1, and then what it does, it kills these two letters and creates a bridge between two circles. So all the other letters remain the same. But then what it does, it looks for all the possible pairs. Right? So this, this was one such a pair, plus all the other pairs. Sometimes the pairings will be zero, sometimes the pairings will be non-zero. You take the sum of all the pairs, you get something. So it turns out that this is a Lie bracket, and this Lie bracket is in, is in fact uh, Something which is which in this theory is known as a necklace Lie bracket. So this there is some they have some some other big story where uh, 
one considers Lie brackets or Lie algebras associated to Grievous, and these are Lie algebra, this is a Lie algebra associated to some particular view. Maybe just to complete the picture, there is a very similar story for for core bracket. Now you, you can just guess. So you have one circle, and on this circle you're searching for pairs of letters with non-vanishing pairing. So here again there will be a pairing, an intersection between A1 and B1, and then you will cut the circle into two parts by a bridge. And between, between them you put a wedge. So that's the structure of this graded, graded gadget. Well, let me finish this statement of the question and indicate with what are the what are the answers to this question known up to now. Is it true that G of sigma together with the Goldman bracket and drive co bracket? Yeah, I think completed. Is isomorphic to the is isomorphic to the graded to the graded gadget. So as as as, as I say, uh, so this this guy the topological definition looks nice, but algebraically uh, this this thing is a lot easier than that one. So um, So the answer is more or less yes. Uh, they are uh, isomorphic, so there are some exotic cases. You, you know, now if we go back and recall that there is this story of framing, then sometimes for uh, genus 1, there are situations when they're actually not isomorphic, but usually for almost, in almost all situations, they are isomorphic. And um, so, so by now there are, there are many proofs um, in different situations. First of all, there is a variety of uh, g equal zero proofs. And uh, the first proof is by Venel, uh, which, uh, which uses the Savage integral construction. And then um, there is another proof by by Kawazumi Kuna Naf and myself, which uses which uses the Kashivara theorem, which 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 is essentially algebraic. It reduces it or Related to the Kashivara variant story. And then um, there is yet another proof by Lauren and myself, which uses the Casey uh, connection. It's not completely excluded that these proofs are in some way all the same, even, even though we don't quite know how to, how to say it. So for instance, probably consider she to go in KZ connection, it doesn't sound like it's very far away. But um, uh, so I, I don't know if it means anything for the proofs to be the same, but you can ask if the isomorphisms are the same. Uh, for the isomorphisms, um, right. For, for, for the isomorphisms, <coughs> for these two proofs, there is a relation. So this KZ um, connection provides an isomorphism which coincides with the uh, KB isomorphisms that you deduce uh, from the KB solution using the K 
phasia associated disorders. So are, are you getting an isomorphism, or are you trying to get all isomorphisms? In? Um, right, okay, that's, that may be another question. Let me comment on it in a second. So, for G non zero, let's say this is maybe at the moment for existence. For uniqueness, there are also some, some questions. So, uh, for G non zero, uh, there is also an upgrade of the Kashinara Bell story. Which, uh, which also gives us, so, so this proof, it admits some kind of relatively significant upgrade, one needs a relatively significant upgrade, but then it, um, it, it provides a proof for G0. And then there is another proof by, by Shane using Hodge theory. So, um, uh, we don't quite know, but maybe uh, I, I, the feeling is that the specialization to G equals zero of Hayes proof should probably be more or less, more, more or less what we did, what we did with the KZ connection. Um, so, um, let's say out of all this variety, right, so, so there is this, uh, there are these two theories, this KV and this Hodge theory, which give, give it for arbitrary genus. Um, the only one that, uh, let's say, but these, these are big machines. The KZ connection has an advantage that this is really a very small machine that essentially one uses to uh, obtain the proof. Now, um, about the uh, uniqueness, right? So that's about existence, about the uniqueness issue. In some simple cases, we have some control, for instance, for a sphere with three holes. Um, there is a little bit of control of uniqueness. In, in other cases, maybe some more complicated. But there, I think, uh, part, um, maybe one of the big messages on uniqueness will be in, uh, in Yusuke's talk. So there, we have, we have a result which uh, does relate uh, uniqueness uh, of this uh, 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 Goldman drive formality to, to uniqueness or to, to, the, uh, to the solutions of the generalized Keshavara verb problem. So, so there, probably Yusuke will tell us a little bit on that. Um, right. So, and I'm not sure, maybe Florian and his talk will touch upon a little bit this uh, solution with the case connection. Uh, I think. Well, I still have four minutes, but I prefer to to, to, to end earlier and go to the coffee break. What what do you think? Well, it's thank you, Tom. <laughs> Any further questions? So you wrote down a, a deep algebra. Can you say anything about the conversation? Um, yeah, there, there is. In fact, it, it, it has a Quantization is a nice quantization due to trial. And, and there, probably one can ask a similar question. Whether one can, in this quantized story, develop this, this, this kind of formality question. And in genus zero, together with uh, Lauren and Travis Shedler, we, we have a preliminary result that it probably still upgrades. Um, we still maybe have a feeling that it should upgrade more easily. But yeah, it's, it's, it probably all goes to, to the quantized world as well. Other questions? A very nice one about the <clears throat> unicity or not of the isomorphism. And I wonder there is always uh, the action of Martin Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's up to that action. Uh, no, but there there is uh, probably more. No, no the uniqueness. You let's say the, the question is you, you want to control. You, you don't hope to have uniqueness because typically even for a sphere this recalls you, you you would always have the action of the Grothendieck uh, 
but it's also defined through the group. So and then then probably more stuff. But even in simplest cases, you already have the working Takmula group, which uh, changes between solutions of the Kashara River problem, but then then if you also operate on those uh, Goldman derived formalities. So it's the uniqueness means whether you can control how many are they. I have a silly, maybe it's a silly question, but you assume that the service has no empty boundary, but when one wants to go to the market, is a significant difference? Or is that a technical reason? Well, probably, one can, probably one can derive statements about the, the surface. Let's say maybe there one question would be uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's more or less technical because if, if there is uh, uh, no boundary, there is no framing. And then uh, uh, one would have to work with the canonical, with the canonical um, uh, derived power bracket, and and then maybe it's difficult to prove statements in two directions. That, for instance, the relation with the Kashivara Venn problem, uh, there it's convenient to have uh, framing. At least if you want to go from uh, Goldman derived to Kashivara Venn, the other way around probably you can still. For example, just uh, we take a base point and uh, remove the base point, uh, except this point, uh, we have a... Uh, no, but then you, you do have one bar if you, if you take uh, the yeah, you the same. Yeah, that, that, that's a good thing. If you have at least one bar with component, then you, you have the, this full power of comparison. If not, you will have less... If the algebraic, algebraic problems in one direction will become more difficult. Maybe maybe justify that. Okay, let's thank Anton again.